International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. My name is Justin DeMong. I'm the chairman of the Before Columbus Foundation. And we are here this afternoon at Lake Merritt in Oakland, California with Frank B. Wilderson, Jr. Third. The third. <laughs> uh, professor at the University of California at Irvine, author, activist, theoretician. And Frank and I met some years ago, not far from here, at the ceremony for the American Book Awards where his memoir, Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid, received the American Book Award and have had a very fruitful and fertile intellectual engagement ever since then. We have. So this is the first time I think we've done this away from the radio. We, we, and, and we've actually, it's the first time we've done it together. Together. Because yes. normally, you call me from the radio station and I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> so I had to get dressed up for this now. <laughs> now the last time we saw each other was also in Oakland at the Oakland Book Festival yes, yes. where you were impaneled first uh, with Simon Critchley and Mark Greif and myself mm -hmm. and later with Astra Taylor and Elaine Brown. Yes. Um, this was in May and Shortly after, uh, in fact, within a couple of weeks, uh, just a few months ago, in Charleston, South Carolina, the shooting of nine members of the congregation at one of the oldest, some say the oldest, uh, black church in the United States of America uh, took place. Uh, this church, which plays an enormous role uh, in black American life and black American Christian life in particular, uh, one of its founders was uh, Denmark Vesey. Mm -hmm. I'd like to begin our interview today by addressing this topic because one of the most disturbing outcomes of that particular incident for me had to do with how quickly it was rearticulated as an occasion for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. As if to suggest that the doctrines of those who were murdered uh, ought to uh, entreat uh, the shooter and his ilk, those of his kind, with a uh, love, a love that forgives. Uh, this is intimately related, it seems to me, to questions of how the black body is imagined, ignored, uh, excavated, buried, or made of use uh, in the American national culture. Could we begin with this idea of forgiveness and, and how this actually obscures the meaning of these events? Yes, well, I, I was disturbed by that also, and it, and it, it continues on. I mean, uh, as Dylan Roof, Roof or Rolf was... Roof, Roof, yes. Was, it sounds like a park, right? Yes. <laughs> as Dylan Roof was being arraigned, uh, the judge was, was asking the family members of the deceased to say anything and one by one mm -hmm. you know they felt it incumbent upon themselves to both articulate their loss mm -hmm. and how overwhelming and and irreparable that was but at the same time to say you know I forgive you mm -hmm. um, now I don't blame them mm -hmm. for that uh, I, 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 I think that I but I share your analysis that that's a big problem mm -hmm. and um, but the reason why I don't blame them, even though I don't want them to do it, mm -hmm. is because black speech is always under coercion. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, there's no temporality and there's no spatiality. There's no, there's no point in history and there's no place on the globe where a, a black person could speak mm -hmm. freely from his or her set of ethical dilemmas. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm and not risk some kind of sudden death. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. very different. I mean, I study under Edward Said, and, that's, and, I, and I argued with him about this. I think that's even different than his condition, mm -hmm. because he had a place in time when he could speak uh, 
as a Palestinian, mm -hmm. free of the coercion of settler domination. Mm -hmm. And the, his political dream was to return to that time, mm. that time and space. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think, and, and of course, as you know, but, but the, the viewers who are not in Oakland, California might not know. I mean, I'm not the first person or the only person to think about this. There's mm -hmm. uh, David Marriott at UC Santa Cruz, University of California Santa Cruz, Jarrett Sexton at University of California Irvine, mm -hmm. Hortense Spillers at Vanderbilt, uh, Sadia Hartman at um, Columbia. All these people have made excellent contributions to this problem mm -hmm. of black grief. Mm -hmm. And the problem of black grief is that um, it saturates us, but as we try to think about it, we can't theorize a prior plenitude, mm -hmm. a place and time before the grief. Mm -hmm. Now, coming full circle to what you said, what that means is that if black grief saturates us and and um, can't be you can't think outside of it right the rage that is that subtends that grief is also something that proliferates exponentially mm -hmm. and Barack Obama as an agent of the state and other people need I think what black politics is all about it's all about anger management huh. Uh -huh. And as opposed to listening to the discourse of black demands, mm -hmm. listening to the discourse of, of black suffering, listening mm -hmm. to the discourse of black anger, mm -hmm. the move to, to kind of lower an anvil of forgiveness on that trauma before the people who have been traumatized can right. actually think it through. Right. That's a symptom of of a of a of a larger policing need. Right. <laughs> you that's know. Right. And that's right. and that's what makes it so horrifying. You know. Mm -hmm. But we understand that ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the job, mm -hmm. um, we're. I don't think there's a black person. I used to think that black people who work for themselves mm. had it different, mm. had it better. Mm. You know. But you don't work for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody has to negotiate how, how much of what is inside my head, how much of what I think about this world can the non-black people around me mm -hmm. take in right. without lynching me. That's right. And once you make that calculation, then you move. Right. But I dream of a time when we could move irresponsibly, mm -hmm. not being responsible mm -hmm. to that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to explore that a little bit further in terms of how we constitute and then articulate ourselves as subjects, since there's this always already at work of calibrating how much can the world actually take or receive in measure of the, the consciousness, the embodiment that I actually experience. Yeah. And we know from what you're saying and from studying our history or intuitively without any yes. serious study, <laughs> A we little know child knows it. <laughs> that, that, that to, to bring the full weight of our experience yeah. onto the present yeah. is, is lethal. It's lethal. It's lethal. And we see that uh, more and more each day. But let me trace that back a little further to where we began and then mm -hmm. set off from there. Mm -hmm. Now, I gave a very brief cursory outline of the, the, the uh, magnitude of the importance of the site where this shooting took place. I mentioned yes. Denmark Vesey, right. and I spoke about the question of forgiveness or the practice of forgiveness actually obscuring memory of, of it, uh, precluding the ability really uh, to excavate uh, what the possibility of mourning would really be. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe, and you and I have discussed this uh, before, uh, I don't believe that the, the space for real grieving or actual mourning here in the United States for blacks has ever been created. Yeah. And it, it's, it's led to a kind of uh, uh, a Sisyphus syndrome, as Du Bois talked about, as Baraka talked about later, uh, where this process of excavating our own history is always being flouted by the national culture, by the mainstream. And so mm -hmm. we only get up to a point so far yeah. where we're able to uh, see a clearing 
and begin the process of grief and mourning, but almost as soon as it begins, it's, it's turned around. There's something in the origin of atrocity and genocide in the development of the new world, which continues to this day, that entreats a kind of unremembering. And strangely enough, the uh, cultural uh, products or byproducts of this unremembering as created by black America uh, are consumed as ideological merchandise, sometimes called race relations by, yeah, yes. by everyone. And, yeah. uh, could you speak a little bit to that, this, this unremembering process or this uh, rolling it up to excavate and then it rolling back down on us? I think you've done a great job. <laughs> I don't know what I could add to that, except to say that you've, you've mentioned Denmark Vesey twice. Yes. And that's really important. Yes. That's really important because um, in another context, let's say this, this um, shooting happened at a, at a mosque in what, what is Israel, uh. for example, and, and the mosque was, um, had a significant political history as uh -huh. this church does in in Charleston South Carolina indeed there would be th there would be competing uh, Palestinian voices uh -huh. for example uh -huh. as opposed to a kind of singular what we what we have now a, a, a singular forgiveness voice from from blacks right. there'd be those who would who would say right. no what's significant about this is the fact that this revolutionary movement had some of its meetings here and mm -hmm. you know got kicked off and let's return to that let's mm -hmm. let's use the occasion of this massacre mm -hmm. to think back to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but no one is saying let's use the occasion of this massacre to think back to slavery bodies. that's right and that's right. and that's you know i think i think you that's hit right. the, the nail on the head that's mm -hmm. really curious mm -hmm. because it shows um how we also feel the need to desire our own repression mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as black people. Mm -hmm. No, th no that's, that's, that's intimately woven into the fabric of, of this unique way that Christian doctrine has been used yeah. to, to undo us. Yes, yeah, because there are, there are, there are many Christ's and many Christian doctrines in that doctrine. There's, right. there's a wrathful God. Right. <laughs> you know? But, but, but you know? as, as David God. Walker's appeal. <laughs> right, exactly. David that, Walker's right? appeal he is right there. Yeah, okay. you know. So, I mean, so, you know. But this is a particular strain <laughs> that's being used to unweave <laughs> yeah. the fabric of actual yeah. black life. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so exactly. with that, w w where the body comes in, how we constitute ourselves as subjects, as embodied subjects sharing life with one another, in order to be more easily understood, it seems that we fall into this trap of re-articulating the same oppression, of actually in some uh, way, uh, some would describe as masochistic, desiring it, uh, to form an identity that's recognizable by the world. It's that I will re-articulate this to be seen. Yeah. Because if I yeah. don't, yeah. I'll just fade away. Is well, there something to that? There is. There is. I mean, and I, I, again, I, you know, because in the past, I know how interviews go so quickly. I want to be sure to say that I, that the process, though, though black people and non-black people both engage in the process that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. my critique is not um, a chastisement right. of black people right because um, once you actually speak as we said before speak the truth then you're in an existential dilemma that's right of, of what you do however um, I think you're I think you're right in that the, the the problem is in articulating the demand mm -hmm. and the reason that the problem is in articulating the demand is because the demand is larger than what can be conceptually grasped. Mm, mm -hmm. And I want to mm. just share a few sentences from something that um, Jared Sexton wrote that, that will help. That will help. Um, and Jared Sexton is a, uh, until recently, he was the director of African American Studies at UC Irvine in Irvine, California. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I've learned a lot from him and people like David Marriott. Mm -hmm. But um, what he's saying here is that anti-black fantasies, mm -hmm. quoting from David Marriott, mm -hmm. have objective value. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, I'll let the truck go by, that if, if, I, fa if I am not black, and I fantasize something about the use of black bodies, mm -hmm. that fantasy can reach beyond my own individual or my own collective bigotry. I can make that fantasy real mm -hmm. because I have a relationship to violence mm -hmm. as a non-black person mm -hmm. that black people don't have. Mm -hmm. And I, I use this phrase non-black specifically mm -hmm. because even though we share certain forms of subjugations that Latinos and Native Americans share. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've been trying to, to write about is the way in which the psychic integration of mm -hmm. people who suffer white supremacy mm -hmm. depends upon two things. One, getting rid of white supremacy, mm -hmm. and two, being anti-black in their own daily lives. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. So these fantasies, Sexton and Marriott and others have said, of other people that are anti-black have objective value. They mm -hmm. can be made real. Mm -hmm. He once said to Sexton once said to a group of of, of uh, undergrads at uh, UC Berkeley mm -hmm. who were getting a little bored with his psychoanalytic uh, interpretation of of the Third World Liberation Front strike in 1999. <laughs> he said, uh, you know. He said, y'all better understand white people's fantasies, right? Because tomorrow there'll be legislation. That's right. <laughs> That's, 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 that's exactly right. Now, the point is that there's that's no... That's exactly right. And, 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 yeah. and that, in part, <laughs> is the, the, the origin yeah. of the so-called new world. Exactly. It was the, the yeah. fantasy yeah. becoming... But our fantasies can't become legislation. That's right. And there's a distinction that, that he makes, which I think is really important. Hmm. Um, he says that um, much of the... Much of the planet's inhabitants who are oppressed are subjected to death in an economy of disposability. Mm -hmm. But what he's trying to do is to show how thinking black subjugation through an economy of disposability mm -hmm. is limited. Mm -hmm. You can think the subjugation of immigrants fleeing Syria mm -hmm. through the economy of disposability. Mm -hmm. You can think the genocide of Native Americans through the economy of disposability. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a certain, the, the, the disposability, the word disposability implies the violence that happens against these people has a certain kind of utility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that makes it, what, what, what makes black life mm -hmm. really hard and black suffering um, insufferable, interminable, mm -hmm. is the fact that um, Every time we try to think about the utility of the violence against us, mm -hmm. we come up short. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to say that over here, there are people who are disposable people, mm -hmm. okay? And it's not like black people don't suffer through that, but that's not the essence of black suffering. Mm -hmm. He says, but blacks are, uh, um, are subjected to, and he's quoting David Marriott, the interminable time of meaninglessness mm -hmm. in personal dying. Mm -hmm. And he says there's a critical difference here, a critical difference between an economy of disposability mm -hmm. and the interminable time of meaningless in personal dying. Mm -hmm. He says the, the legacy bequeathed by racial slavery that black life is meaningless mm -hmm. and so black death is meaningless. Now mm -hmm. this is really important mm -hmm. because we, Lacan, Marx and a lot of people who have made paradigmatic shift, mm -hmm. shifts have also articulated how the death of the subaltern can mean. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that the death of a black person doesn't mean mm -hmm. because the life mm -hmm. of a black person hasn't meant. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, I've raised two girls and this mm -hmm. is a hell of a thing Mm -hmm. to have in your mind mm -hmm. trying to raise a child. Mm -hmm. You got two choices. You lie to the kid, mm -hmm. which says, your life has meaning, mm -hmm. and then they have their nigger moment, and they're like, what did you tell, you know? Mm -hmm. 
or you tell the truth and it's totally debilitating. But mm -hmm. just this last little paragraph, David, David he, Sexton quotes David Murray, and I think this is really poignant. He writes, the legacy bequeathed by racial slavery, that black life is meaningless, meaningless, mm -hmm. and so black death is meaningless, is a legacy in which death is nothing, neither a passage nor a journey but simply the arbitrary visitation of a catastrophic violence, a death that cannot ever die because it depends on the total degradation and disavowal of black life. This is no longer death, but a deathliness that cannot be brought into meaning, that cannot be brought into meaning. Mm -hmm. This death has nothing, less than nothing. This is, this is, this is death as nothing, less than nothing. As such, this death is never assumable as possibility. Mm -hmm. Now, what Barack Obama has to do is he has to go down, and whether it's Clinton or you know wh whomever, mm -hmm. and and this is the context in which we live and die. Mm -hmm. But as you said earlier, we don't want that context. Mm -hmm. We yearn for recognition and incorporation. Mm -hmm. And so the contradiction or the, or the clash between the place where the world has put us, mm -hmm. which is Negro, you live death. Mm -hmm. And when we kill you, when you stop breathing, that is not going to be a punctuation mark, which mm -hmm. then works back on the years that you breathe to give it meaning. That's just going to be your withering away. Mm -hmm the way in which grass withers away, mm -hmm. the way in which stones wither away. Mm -hmm. As if it were a natural law. As if it were a natural law. Which, 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 which is re-articulated through the racism but, that poisons the science. Right, but the problem is that the, when you get to be my age, 59, mm -hmm. you accept that. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. you just, you do what you do. You, you, mm -hmm. you drink, mm -hmm. you smoke weed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have a ton of affairs, you know, mm -hmm. that's the deal. But. The problem is that people 15 to 25 haven't learned mm. to accept that. Mm -hmm. So they have to be managed mm -hmm. because if they're not managed, they could actually spark another rebellion. Mm -hmm. And that's what this, and that's, and to manage them, we bring them into the church mm -hmm. or we put them in prison. And out of school. Or out of school. Or out of school. get them on crowd. Out of the, yeah. But, but the, 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 the conflict, the collision between the desire for recognition and incorporation and this meaningless black life that will lead to a meaningless black death. Mm -hmm. Once people have had enough of that, then you got to do anger management on the black mm -hmm. community. And that's very different mm -hmm. than asking the Palestinian, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. What are your politics? Mm -hmm. The problem of blackness is a big, is a problem beyond what can be actually conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to, I want to hold that and just pivot slightly. Yeah. And uh, right now, uh, in real time, as I mentioned, uh, we're in Oakland, California at, at Lake Merritt. Uh, but for many in our audience who are sharing this time with us, they're watching it on the internet. Yes. Uh, the internet, which really in essence is a massive archive, has recently, uh, in recent years most especially, been inundated with images of young black folk, largely, but not entirely, uh, being uh, murdered by police with impunity. Yes. This has sparked uh, a great deal of uh, discourse on the internet and outside of it. But where I'm driving at with this is a legacy that has never really withdrawn here in the United States that traces itself back to lynching as popular entertainment. Yes. Yeah, Although yeah, it's almost yeah, been erased yeah, yeah. and scrubbed away, even yeah. from colleges and universities, as a subject of serious inquiry. <laughs> in Texas. The fact of the matter is, <laughs> yes. is that is that yeah. lynching of blacks was a form of popular entertainment yes, in the yeah. United States yes. for centuries. Okay? Centuries, yeah. right? So, uh, not long ago, uh, a fine arts press, I believe it was either Twelve Trees or, or Twin Palms, published a book uh, called Without Sanctuary. Yes. The book could barely get reviewed in the United States. Yeah. I didn't find out about it except that I was reading an Italian newspaper. Uh, it received uh, uh, essays from Hilton Owls and John Lewis. 
Uh, but the point that comes out of that for me, and that's related to what you're saying, and, and the recent inundation of images of uh, slaughter, police slaughter of uh, black folk on the internet, is, is, is basically this. As I studied those images again and returned to them recently, uh, and observed the crowds, uh, often well-dressed in a very celebratory mood, bring the family, bring the kids, and God knows what happened before and after, for those who are interested in reading about it, and I recommend you should. Uh, but it's a tradition. Yeah. It's a form of entertainment. Yeah. And it's one that never really went away. It's being represented as sort of a new thing. But for those who are on the other side of this equation, who are not the victims, it is, in fact, a celebration. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years, there have been extreme problems with video evidence uh, of beatings and shootings of uh, blacks and other immigrants into Europe that are actually represented on the internet by the hate groups as means of recruiting. Yeah. When the Michael Brown uh, story was hitting the press and many of our uh, uh, so-called uh, progressive, uh, liberal, uh, so-called allies were expressing their sentiments of, of, of grief and solidarity. Um, I recommended to, to many of them that, that, that they begin to investigate what the other side was saying about this incident. Yeah. Go to the internet and find out what the other side is saying. Yeah. Don't congratulate yourself on simply being sensitive to this. <laughs> Just look at what the other side is saying. So yeah. I'd like to explore from your reading of Sexton, what the issue of the image of black death has come to mean in contemporary life. Now, I said it has deep historical roots, but right now we're seeing it proliferate and get attention vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the internet, where we are now with you. Frank, could you speak to that, how this is being used or misused? Is it a tradition? Do you agree with that assertion that I've made? Uh, as, a, as an entertainment, and of what objective use are these videos? They're not allowed as evidence. Even the video of Rodney King wasn't allowed as evidence. That's very interesting. It's very interesting. And yet they proliferate. And yet they proliferate. They're becoming yeah. ubiquitous. Yeah. You know? Uh, so, without necessarily inviting in the question of technology, but the archive and its use, the use of the image of black death yeah. uh, as, a, as a ritual substance, yeah. as a means of providing integrity to the system of oppression, yeah. which seems to be addressed here in a, in yeah. a, in, in, in yeah. a not so oblique way, but you've, you've seen what's happening. What are your thoughts about this? Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, and I, I think that you know, the book that you're talking about, Without, without Sanctuary, sanctu without sanctuary uh, I would never have found it except that um, I was teaching at UC Berkeley and my wife was teaching at Cabrillo Community College and she needed a way to um, um, teach about this episode in history uh, to people who didn't have the academic skill set mm -hmm. that... Uh, people at Berkeley might have because they're trying to get into Berkeley. So mm -hmm. she found this book mm -hmm. and began teaching from it and, and that's how I learned about it. And in the process, um, I also came to uh, what I think is perhaps the most definitive um, set of postulates that answer what you're saying, mm -hmm. which, which again I, I said David Marriott, his book On, on Black Men. And on the, Black Men. On Black Men. David Marriott. Uh, to, it was published in uh, 2000 by Columbia University Press. But the first chapter is called, um, <laughs> it's a quote mm -hmm. from a southern white poor person, and it goes, I'm going to borrow me a Kodak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to borrow me a Kodak. And then the, the subtitle is Photography and Lynching. There it is. And what, there it is. what he says is precisely what, what you were saying is that, you know, um, really, these are mass picnics. Yeah. 
And what's interesting about the, this is that they're, they're in a southern town yeah. or in Duluth, Minnesota. I'm from That's Minneapolis, right. Duluth, Minnesota, where a lot of lynchings happen also. Right. You have class divisions amongst whites. Right. But the lynching is not a class divided occasion. Huh. That's a communal occasion uh -huh. for all people to come together. This doesn't mean that the class divisions go away, right. that the rich white person gets to love the poor white person. Right. What it, Marriott argues is that this is, the, this is a more fundamental occasion huh. than sustaining class identity. Mm. What this occasion does is it, is it catalyzes and sustains subjectivity. Mm. So what he says is that the lynching photograph Mm -hmm. jettisons the production of selfhood, the mm. capacity for one to produce a self. Mm. It makes it exponentially more possible mm -hmm. than what was going on beforehand, mm. which is what happened before you got the Kodak. Mm -hmm. You had to slice the genitals mm -hmm. and put them in a jar, pickle mm -hmm. them. Right. Now, not everybody could go home with a genital. Right. Someone who went home with a genital in a pickled jar could say, this is what makes me mm -hmm. different mm. from non-being. Mm -hmm. Non-being is up in the tree. Mm. Inhumanness mm -hmm. is in the tree. Mm -hmm. I often think of myself as, as, I've been made to think of myself as being inhuman mm -hmm. because I don't have a job, mm -hmm. I'm a white sharecropper, mm -hmm. this, that, and the other, right? Mm. But this lynching and this, this pickled genital helps me hmm. fashion a self. Well, the photograph makes that proliferate communally mm. because the photograph right, can right. become the postcard. Right. The postcard the of... The postcard. And the, and the back of the postcard, it says, wish you were here. That's right. Some <laughs> of them do say that. <laughs> Some say of them that. say that. Wish you were here. Yeah. Wish you were here. So we have this... Now we're in this double bind with the online video of the, snu of the snuff. Mm -hmm. incident. Which is basically what it is. Which is basically what it is. Because on the one hand, again, getting back to the desire inside of us to be recognized as people, mm -hmm. we say, look at this video of the cop shooting this guy in the back eight times. Mm. That's inhuman behavior. Mm. Don't you agree, world? Mm. And the world out of this side of the mouse, because as Fanon says, you know, after World War II, the world is embarrassed mm. to think of civil society as a murderous juggernaut. Mm -hmm. It needs mm -hmm. to think of itself as civil. Mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson didn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. I love Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. Okay? He said, these are the slaves I killed. Mm -hmm. These are the Indians I scalped. Mm -hmm. And that's why you should vote for me. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> but there was no contingency <laughs> that, that we had to I mean, create you know, a civil... I, you know, and this is why I love Donald Trump. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't mm -hmm. vote, so I'm not I'm not being serious here. Mm -hmm. But um, but I, I I love the raw racism mm -hmm. f that won't allow for the problem mm. that you and I in the 21st century mm -hmm. are faced with mm. with the video mm -hmm. of the killing with impunity. Mm -hmm. It's a problem mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. our our mm -hmm. ancestors were not faced with with the lynching photograph. Mm -hmm. The lynching photograph announced itself mm. as, a, as, a, as a kind of like poetry, mm -hmm. like song, mm -hmm. like dance. Mm -hmm. It was a cultural accompaniment mm -hmm. to, to the production of white community. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got to do harder work mm -hmm. to see the video mm -hmm. as a form of poetry, dance, mm. song, mm -hmm. cultural accompaniment mm -hmm. to the production of non-black accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Precisely because there's so many goddamn white progressives who say, this will help us get justice. Right. <laughs> which, 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 which would now know an interesting inversion on that gesture yeah. uh, that is being made uh, by those white liberals that you described is that, is that they use the, the object or the archive as a way of attaining ironic distance yeah. from the event itself. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which uh, basically announces in so many words that for them, that's not me. And I'm not well, like those people. Well, there's the honesty. When in fact, yeah. they are the ones who maintain oh, I the integrity yeah. of yeah. The, yeah. The, the archive itself. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're total 
they're in denial, they're disavowed, and, and they're completely lacking in integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the, the, you're, you're, you're spot on. The, the proliferation of these videos, we keep saying, this will bring justice, this will bring justice. Well, maybe in one or two instances it gets someone convicted, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the dynamic. In mm -hmm. fact, it enhances the dynamic. It enhances it. it en Be yeah. Because, it, because it. It, is, it can work faster, um, it can go further, mm -hmm. it can work faster and go further than mm -hmm. the postcard. Just mm -hmm. as the postcard worked faster and went further than the pickle genital, mm -hmm. so can this video. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the problem with American political discourse mm -hmm. is, a structural, is, a, is a structure of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if the police or it's an ambulance. <laughs> I thought they were going to go have lunch. <laughs> but, uh, um, and what I mean by the problem of political discourse is that um, the structure of discourse is hemmed in by ideology even before it gets content. That's absolutely right. And the problem with the structure of discourse for black people is that we're hemmed in with two imperatives. One is the descriptive gesture to describe the, the context of the command modality, to describe the context of the violence. But then there's the prescriptive gesture, which is to say, answer Lenin's question, what is to be done? Mm -hmm. And I think what Marriott in, and, and being quoted by Sexton in this article and what mm -hmm. I'm saying other people are saying is that mm -hmm. that shackles you. Mm -hmm. having, mm -hmm. having to think, having to have a solution to a problem that you present. Mm. I've, I, you know, I've written very controversially, but that is a structural dynamic of anti-black rhetoric. That's absolutely correct. You see that played out in the court system every single day. Yeah. In the criminal, so-called criminal justice system, yeah. every single day, in the form of prosecutorial misconduct. Yes. You yeah. know, yeah. and and yeah. and and its cousin, minimum sentencing. Yeah. And I'll give you a, a prime example of that, which many people are familiar with. We're all drearily familiar with the fact that the district attorney's office and the prosecutors, and their friends in the police department have a routine of ramping up the highest possible charge that is available to them on the books so that they can get a 95 percent conviction rate because almost everyone with common sense will plea out to a guilty charge that is somewhere in the middle of the highest possible charge yeah. that was put into place yeah. and I think that that's a strict legal parallel to what to what you're describing exactly and that gets back to the idea that you spoke of earlier wherein really we're not allowed to actually give voice no. to the embodied no. experience that, no. that, that, that we have um, I know we don't have too much time left and uh, I want to thank you again for being so generous uh, thank with you. us thank you. Um, but uh, you mentioned uh, Andrew Jackson and you mentioned uh, Donald Trump uh, I was earlier. kidding about liking them. Well, yeah, of course. I, I, mean, I like. I, I think we. Are, we I want to get back to that. raw fascism, though. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, one one of the things that uh, that that I find uh, very instructive yeah. uh, about his candidacy, if, you can, yeah. if, if it can be called that, <laughs> right. is is that yeah. since he's polling uh, at almost a third, yeah, and everyone else is in single digits, right. Uh, uh, the Republican National Committee, which ostensibly is on all of their side, right. uh, can't do anything about it. Right. And none, neither can the other others in the clown car. Right. Where every, every time they unpack the clown car and they all get out, <laughs> nobody can hit at him too hard because they want his potential delegates. Yeah. And he's inflaming the most violent, backward, and criminal elements in American life. And it doesn't seem as if anybody's prepared to really stop him because of the money involved. And he resonates very deeply with the sort of settler versus native, cowboy versus Indian yeah. uh, narrative that's already in place. Could you speak a little bit to that since, I mean, this is a very topical well, moment. Whatever, I mean, I don't, I, don't trust, um, I don't trust radicals. I don't trust progressives. I damn sure don't trust liberals. Um, because and when I say I don't trust them, um, I don't mean that if they say something negative about Donald Trump, like mm -hmm. I might hear on KPFA, mm -hmm. that they would be lying mm -hmm. at the level of 
rational discourse. Mm -hmm. What I believe is that they would be not in touch with their unconscious um, mm -hmm. right. exuberance. That's right. In other words, re regardless right. of what side of the political spectrum uh, a non-black person might mm -hmm. find themselves on, mm -hmm. they all find him refreshing. Mm -hmm. And refreshing mm -hmm. is part of the libidinal economy. Mm -hmm. You know, the libidinal economy desire, lethal consumption, mm. aggression, mm -hmm. these are as important, if not more important, than the rational kind of calculation of profit and loss mm. that mm -hmm. a Marxist might make. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the voting booth is like the unconscious. It's a closed, curtained off place in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I believe that the truth will come out in the voting booth. Mm -hmm. When we had, I can't remember if it was Proposition 21, mm -hmm. uh, several, uh, well, it's actually 99, which is to say that if a, a kid tags a building with graffiti and it costs uh, $4,000 for the owner to clean, that used to be a felony until then. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's $400, mm -hmm. then that becomes a felony. Mm -hmm. And if the child was 18 years of or eight older and it was a $4,000 cleanup job, mm -hmm. that child, that adult would go to San Quentin. Now mm -hmm. we have, if the child is 14 years of age, he or she graffitis a building in California, it costs the owner $400 to clean up the building, then that child can go to San Quentin mm, for 18 mm, months. Mm, and mm. you know, I was doing political work uh, with Sexton and, and uh, a, a woman who's a professor at University of California, Ir Irvine, who also uh, writes an Afro-pessimist vein, a, 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 law, a law theory professor named Sora Hahn. Mm. We were all in school in Berkeley, mm. and we were thinking, let's get out there and educate people mm. about how wrong it is to send a child 14 years of age to San Quentin for 18 months mm. for $400 worth of, of, you know, stupid, 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 stupid. Mm -hmm. You cannot educate the unconscious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no mm -hmm. time in the unconscious mm -hmm. and there's no rationale. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to one person mm -hmm. in Northern California mm -hmm. who wanted that law. Mm. And the way, the way that our radical um, organizing was going, it looked like it was going to fail mm. by about 40%. It, it passed by about 65%, mm -hmm. meaning that people lied. Mm -hmm. But I did something that showed, that educated me. I called up one of the lawyers who wrote the bill. And the bill had two iterations, which I won't, it takes a long time to go, but the first iteration of the bill tells you how to make sure that if a kid graffitis a building, and he's white or she is white, they go to juvie. Mm. But if a kid comes in who's black or brown, they go to adult court. Mm. And so that's the big bill. Mm. Then when they put it up to be passed, they whittle that stuff down mm. and make it more palatable. Mm. But all the people who are going to be working this bill, mm -hmm. social workers, prosecutors, judges, have read it in its first iteration. Mm. So they know this is an anti-black child uh, bill. Okay? Yeah. So I called yeah. one of the lawyers and I said, hey man, um, I gave him my real name because I wasn't known then. Right. I said, this is Frank Wilderson, and I am a freelance reporter for the National Review. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, oh, Bill Buckley's... Is, I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I said, well, first of all, I just want to commend you on this wonderful piece of legislation that you've written. And uh, we're doing all that we can to make sure that it, that it pass. And so then I asked him a few questions. We have this great <laughs> white to white conversation, you know. Uh, <laughs> for, for, the, for the first time in my life, I, I knew what it was like to be spoken to honestly, you know. <laughs> it, was just, it, was actually, it was actually wonderful, you know. And I was like, I was like, I, you know. So I knew that I was supposed to get this dude off the phone, but I was clowning. So I was like, you know, because I said, you know what? There are a lot of these like weirdos mm. in Oakland, California, mm. Berkeley, and San Francisco. Mm. And they're gonna, they're gonna raise, you know, this is gonna pass in Orange County, but they're gonna raise some issues about this law. Mm. And one of the issues they're gonna raise is you're sending children to San Quentin for graffiti in a building that costs $400. You know, how would you respond to that? Mm. And he said, Frank, I have a child. Do you have a child? I said, yes, I do. And at the time, my daughter was about 14. Mm. And uh, I told him that, you know, and he says, well, then as 
a parent of a young teenager like myself, you know something. Mm. I said, well, I think I do. He says, you know that our children are not those children. Mm. Mm. Those mm. are animals. Mm. Mm. Ours are children. Mm. Mm. And mm. the bill is structured in such a way that it will, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff mm. when the time comes at the, at the moment of adjudication. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry. We're mm -hmm. not sending children to San Quentin. Mm. Just like that. Mm -hmm. That is the real America speaking. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what happens in the voting booth. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in the libidinal economy. Mm -hmm. And that's what used to happen when the world and America in particular lived their conscious and unconscious life on the surface. That's right. But the middle of the 20th century, that living that life on the surface became not wrong, mm -hmm. but embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to unpack this a little bit in terms of human, animal, and the rituals, the, the necessary imperative rituals that refresh and renew and rejuvenate the libidinal economy that you're speaking yeah. of. Yeah. Because it seems to me that this refreshing ritual, this rejuvenating ritual is one uh, that is constantly in motion because there's a, 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 a kind of a vampiric process taking place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, uh, it can't just simply uh, be left to dry out on its own. It has to constantly yeah. be uh, yeah. uh, infused yeah. 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 Uh, uh, in, shall we say, uh, new and interesting ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one of uh, the latest uh, was the election of a black president, yes, uh, yes. which I think began in its infancy with a kind of negrophilia, yeah, it was, but, yeah. but tapped into <laughs> that <laughs> libidinal economy yeah. that you're speaking yeah. of as a form of refreshment yeah. very quickly yeah. uh, and, and with great ease yeah. uh, into uh, uh, negrophobia. Yeah. And these are two sides of the same libidinal equation, aren't exactly. they? Because, because the idea of the animal yeah. and the animal world somehow being a more sensual, intuitive one uh, has been um, a, a product of whites oppressing blacks uh, as a kind of erotic function in their own society. Yeah. And uh, make not just simply making an object, but rather as an erotic function. Now we don't have too much time left, so I know we want to wrap this up now. But can you respond to that? That's a very. I agree with you, and, and it's a very complicated thing to to, un, to, to unpack. Uh, I, I'll say this, and I think that I would really encourage people um, to read three books that have been um, really important to me. One is Sadia Hartman's Scenes of Subjection. And one of the points that she makes in Scenes of Subjection, um, it's, a, it's about slavery in the 19th century, but she said in an interview with me and on record, that's really an allegory of the present, hmm. is that black violence comes to other people hmm. when they break the constraints of the consensual arrangement mm. in the society in which they live, mm. which mm -hmm. is to say, mm. when they violate the hegemonic dictates of a society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hegemonic dictate meaning, this is the United States of America, it is not Turtle Island, okay, mm -hmm. now you begin to move like the American Indian Movement did, mm -hmm. as though this is Turtle Island, mm -hmm. boom, F-16s, FBI, and everybody come down on you at, at Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. Um, this is California. This is not Mexico. You begin to violate that hegemonic. You 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 show you you give spontaneous consent to that, and maybe you can dodge the violence in some ways. You don't give spontaneous consent to that, in through immigration that isn't legal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then the violence comes down on you. The point that Hartman is making is that there is no consensual arrangement for black people. Mm -hmm. There's the civil society isn't saying consent to this hegemonic 
hmm. set of discourses hmm. or violence will happen. That's what they say to the post-colonial, that's mm -hmm. what they say to the Native American, that's mm -hmm. what they say to the immigrant, that's what they say to the worker. Mm -hmm. We live in a regime of violence mm -hmm. which is necessary for its own sake because it doesn't produce subjugation on our part. That's a secondary issue. Hmm. What it produces is a sense of presence for everyone else, uh, right. which is why That's it must it, yeah. be repeated. Yeah. It can right. never stop. Right. It must be repeated. Right. And so, um, negrophilia is a form of accumulating blackness, whether it's accumulating the smile of Obama mm -hmm. and his presence in the White House, mm -hmm. accumulating black music, mm -hmm. accumulating black sex objects, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it looks like some, it looks like something altogether but violence. However, mm -hmm. as Fanon points out, you know this very well, mm -hmm. it, is the, it is the irrational, gratuitous nature of the subjugation of violence that allows that to happen. That's exactly We become right. objects of someone else's negrophilia That's because exactly we live right. in a regime of violence that isn't based on our consent or, or, t or, our, or our rejection of consent. Mm -hmm. Negrophobia is more obvious mm -hmm. because the violence comes immediately with the negrophobia. Mm -hmm. The negrophilia is an effect of that gratuitous violence, mm -hmm. but it's still the problem that we have is that we live in a regime of violence mm -hmm. for which there is no sense making mm -hmm. except to say mm -hmm. that it produces psychic stability mm -hmm. in the minds and in the communities of everyone who is not black and i'll just mm -hmm. stop there on that. okay yeah well as always it feels like we're just getting started <laughs> i know i know i know call me up on the radio and okay again. let's do it again <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much for sharing this time with us. I've and, enjoyed it. Uh, Frank Wilderson. <laughs>